we are all we we all have to be on apiroom.net and uh, you must be logged in so that you must be able to click on this button and this button so we're gonna we're gonna go through a sample very very simple uh, example just to show you how the this uh, this backend works so we we'll start with creating a key pair so example, then click on create a keeper. This appears. So this this script you can run it. You can run it here in the front end by pressing play. But that's not what we want to do. Cool. What we want to do is create an API, and this we call it uh, test key gen. And we we click on we just click on save everything and click on save. When this happens, I go to my contracts and this script will be in the bottom, which is this. OK. So if everything went well, you will see your script in the bottom. And here on the right side, you can open the API that is exposed on top of that script. If you look at the bottom left of my screen, when I put my mouse on link, you see that uh, the link points to apiroom.net slash api slash dine.org, which is my account, slash test keygen. If I click on this and open it on a new tab, this happens. And I can click on it over and over again. And I will have a new keeper every time uh, to make sure that you, you believe that this is a real API, I'm going to go to test API that opens a swagger for all the, all the scripts that I have. Yeah, my, my computer is super slow when I'm sharing my screen. So the last one is, uh, what, what was it? Test kitchen, this one. So if I am here, I do try out, execute. Yeah, this calls us worker. What I want to do is I want to copy this curl line. And I will copy it yeah, somewhere here in my Linux box. Is it alive? Yes. So I'm going to paste this curl line. And you see that I get a keeper back when I curl it. Okay, so the curl is curling this API and is getting this back. All right, so this is the way the, this part of API room works. So basically you do, you do your script here, then you click on create an API, it actually creates an API. This is needed to use the Sorum integration because Everything that uh, you see uh, in the back end works using Restroom MW, which is a, a JavaScript extension of Zenroom that executes some uh, statements. Uh, well, that, that goes through the scripts. It finds the statements it knows. It executes those and it leaves all the other statements with Zenroom. So you can have uh, some cryptography done in Zen room and some connection to the outside world on in restroom. Okay, so uh, the ones we're showing today are those two. So room, write data in a blockchain batch and so room, read data from a blockchain batch. The first one is this. I'm now gonna go to the script and then we will execute it together. Uh, if you look at the comments, so here, everything that has a, uh, what is this called? A, a hash sign, hashtag is a comment. If you look at the comment, you basically have the instruction or the explanation of what a script does. But I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go there for you. I'm gonna go there, for, I'm gonna go through that for you. So line number, line number five, given that I have an endpoint named time server, which is this. So this is an endpoint that we're gonna use to pull data from the internet. Given that I have a number named timestamp, this will be this will be used. Uh, so this is the object that we're going to use to store the result of the REST API of uh, that we're going to pull in a second. Line number seven, given that I connect to time server and save the output timestamp. 
So this does basically what this packet does. It connects to this and it saves the output into the, a number object called timestamp. Now we get into the showroom specific statements. So line number 10, given that I have a showroom endpoint named showroom endpoint, which is this one. So this is simply one of the four nodes of our testnet, of our showroom testnet. You don't need to worry about this. For now, you just leave it like this. And here we do, given that I have an ID for a showroom context name, my context ID one, given that I have an ID for a showroom context name, name context ID two. So those two numbers, one is this and one is this one. They are used to generate the batch ID under which your data will be stored. So right now, uh, in order to generate the batch ID, we start from those. We do some, um, there are some algorithms, I think there is a hashing uh, that goes through. And uh, that will be the unique ID of the batch that you can later use to retrieve the, the data. Um, we haven't implemented it, implemented it yet, but in a couple of weeks, we will have a, a call to showroom where you just provide this, so the, the, the ID you have uh, uh, used yourself. And based on that, showroom will return the data that you saved. We don't have it yet. So now uh, when you save data, showroom is gonna give you back return uh, uh, the batch ID and you have to store that. But uh, in a couple of weeks, we will, uh, will be more streamlined. Anyway, so you have to pass to showroom this, which is a completely arbitrary string or number. Now, uh, this is a, a random uh, 32 bytes uh, number in um, base 64. And I added Andrea three here. I could change it to Andrea, whatever. I can change it to Andrea one, two, three. And this, I could call it John Doe. So you just give it whatever you want. This is an ID generated. It can be of any length, any shape, whatever you like. Here I am generating some random number just for the fun of it. Here I am printing out uh, the output. And this is what I asked the, the, the blockchain to do. Then I ask showroom to save the data, which is the one I printed. No, sorry, wrong. Then I ask Sorum to save the data named my random array, which is this basically, is the array of three random, three random objects of 256 bits with the context ID, my context ID. So this should result in Sorum creating a batch that contains this piece of data. Sorry, this piece of data, this. And then again, then I ask showroom to save the data named timestamp, which is the output of this, uh, this rest with the context ID, my context ID too, and that's it. So in order to, to, to store something on showroom, you have to, you need to have three things, an endpoint, a context ID, and then this statement to ask showroom to save to a context ID. Here I'm doing it uh, twice in the same script, just for the fun of it. Just to show you that you can, uh, you can store several pieces of information in several batches with one script. Okay, this one, I can save it. Uh, Andrea, one, two, three. Well, I, I'll use the one that I've already saved here so that I, I don't make this dirtier than, than what it is. So, so room writes. Just let me check that the script is the same. Yes, it's exactly the same script. Given that I have a sorum man point name, sorum man point, context ID, context ID, then I ask sorum to save the data with the context. Yeah, all right. You saw it. This is linked. This is, uh, this is, this is, this is, this can be called from the API that you can find at apiroom.net slash API slash dynorc slash sawroom, sorry, write, not read. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna 
uh, open this in new tab and see the result. Here we go. So those two things that you see here, they are the, the output, hold on. Those two things that you see here, they are the result of those two statements. So they are just here to, to show you what came, what I have, uh, what is gonna be saved in the, in the blockchain. Now this is written close. While this, so so room has two JSON files under it, one and two, where this is the context idea I gave it. This one is something that you cannot really use for now. And this is the thing that you have to store, the batch ID. Andrea three, Andrea four. Yeah, okay, this is, this is probably uh, this one, this contains this one, and this other one contains the random array. So this is the script to store data. The mirror of this script is the one to read data, which you can also find in examples, which is this. Sorum read data from a blockchain blockchain batch. So here again, you need to define. Okay, here we don't have the concept of a, of Soru endpoint. You just need to define a string named endpoint. Then you have a string named batch batch ID, which is the thing that you you got here. So the endpoint is this. A string name match ID, it is down here. Then I have a string dictionary name Sorum. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, an object that Zenroom needs because it, it will be filled with the output of the query to the Sorum uh, blockchain. So basically those are the, the, the three things you need. In the endpoint, the batch ID, and then you need to create the object that will be filled. This is the, the query to the blockchain to retrieve the data. And that connect to the serum, the serum endpoint this, and read the batch with the ID this, which is this one, and save the output to Sorum, which is this. That's all. So can and I ask, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. So is it correct that we have to use the batch ID because there's only one transaction in the batch? And At the moment, yes. Okay. At the moment, yes. And also, uh, please bear in mind that when you write, so uh, the way that this we implemented right now, when you write, you can write multiple batches, but when, when you read at the moment, you can only read one batch per time. So we can only use one transaction per batch, basically, because otherwise you could not uh, get to the information. You I am right? not sure if you can store several transactions in one batch. I need to ask this to Puria. It could be possible, or it could be that we can implement it. At the moment, that, that that's the way it is. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And I'm gonna show you how this works with a, uh, with the script that I save already, which is right down here, saw room read, just to make sure that's the same thing. Given I have a string name endpoint, given I have a string name batch ID, given I have a string issue named saw room, and I connect to saw room endpoint. Uh, for you guys who have never seen this, so here you have the script, and here you have the, the data that is gonna be passed to the script. And uh, I, I, okay, let's, Let's curl this instead of showing it as a result. So you see what comes out of it. We do again. Yeah, we, we were here already. Uh, ECDH. But you have to you have to change the batch ID, right? Because you got a different batch ID. But I'm I'm gonna show one that I've saved already, just okay. for the sake of it. I saw that. Okay, try it out. So very important to know is that when you are in Swagger. Also, when you are in, in the API mode, um, hold on.
Let me show you a more complex script. Yeah, it is. Okay. So here we have the script. Then here we have some data, which is a key pair. And here we have some more data. If you store this in the back end, so here, you see that some scripts have both keys and data stored. So here, if you click on show, it shows it while this is empty. If you try and run this uh, as an API, or if you test it in Swagger, it's uh, only the key, only the content of this parameter will be passed to the API, not this. This is the reason why we put this red dot here. We did it as a choice because uh, uh, you can call an API with two sets of data where one of them is stored locally and the other one comes from the, the, the API call. That was just to, to show you how this thing works. So I would expect you to do something like this. Let's do execute. Okay, so here I, I got this result, but let me show you how you have to do it in reality. Mm. Okay, this is the one, this is the one that I that I created. This I think is the timestamp. So let's get it, let, let's let's get it done for real. Let's do a real example. And let me show you how you are really supposed to use this. Control X, Control V, and we save this to Soru read uh, data, let's say. No, real example, good. So I have this here in the background, uh, in, the, in the back end. You see that now the keys are stored here under data. They're not stored under keys anymore. I'm gonna copy this quickly. And I will show you that. Now I'm gonna, ref, ref, well, close it a little bit again. I am gonna open Swagger again. And I will show you that this script that is the same as before with the same data as before right now will not run. Uh, so um, read real example, this one. Okay. If I try to run this, it will, the it, uh, Zen room will complain that some data is not there. Yeah, unexpected section, blah, 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 blah. Something is wrong because some data is missing. Okay, the, 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 the exception could be better. But anyway, we will work on it. But believe me, the reason is, is that it is expecting some data that we're not passing. So what do we do? We pass it here. And we try to run it again. And now magically it's working. And here I am copying the curl. I'm gonna curl it on my screen once more. I'm just gonna do this to, you know, yeah, all right. So curl minus exposed API room dot net blah blah. So room read real example. So room read real example. Blah, 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 minus D, which means data, data, and this is the con, this is the stuff that I passed it, okay? Now I'm gonna pass this again, I'm gonna run it again, and I get the output. The output is formatted like this. This is stuff that, uh, so batch ID is the one that we passed. C75 FA, we, we see it also here. End point, it is uh, here. And this is the, the stuff that we stored in, uh, in the Sorum blockchain, which is, it should be the timestamp. It ends with 3054. Is it true? Yes, 3054. Now, one more improvement, we, sorry, here. 
one more improvement we'll do. Now you, you always have the output with result and result, and this is a string. If I pass it, uh, 354, I pass it this one. I'm gonna pass it the other one, the other, uh, the other batch ID that should contain this array. So it should contain an object named my random array that has three, those three numbers inside. Just changing this thing here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I execute it again. And you see, I, I get this result, which is okay. I didn't get the name of the object, but I get the three random numbers. So MN3H, 9SUX. Here we go. MN3H, 9SUX. So uh, one more improvement that we're doing, and maybe this man will do it, uh, is that instead of having a result column, uh, this, then again, uh, a result with a, with a huge uh, escape string, we will format it a little bit nicer on, uh, in, in, a JSON, in a JSON object. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get one thing. Why did, why did we get timestamp earlier? Because, okay, let's look at the script again. Let's look at, it's, it's a good point because other people may be confused. So this is the script that generated it. So you go to example and you do sort and write data. Here, I am storing two batches, context ID one, context ID two, and I, I'm having two, two, two statements to save two batches. In one of them, I am storing my random array. In one of them, I'm storing my stamp. Clear. So you could add the third one and fourth one. Uh, you, you asked if you could save two objects in the same, um, uh, with the same context. I don't know. Maybe we can try. Let's give it a try. Context ID one. Let's see. It's probably going to crash. Let's give uh, five random objects of 64 bits. Good. And this, we store it, we call it, yeah, create API. Uh, so room, write tests, multiple. Of multiple objects, multiple, yeah, let's call it like this. Okay, I'm gonna try now. I don't expect it to work, but if you're lucky, change, maybe you it will. The batch ID, the batch ID is still the same. It doesn't matter. I shouldn't be unique then. It doesn't have to be unique, but okay, let's change it. Let's call it A and this, let's call it B. I don't think, uh, I don't think it makes a difference. Okay, let me try and run this. And what is the use if it's not need to be? Okay, unique? it is. Uh, it worked. So this is the this is the batch ID. So let's run this into here. So those are the the random numbers. That's the timestamp. Timestamp ends with eight five one, and random numbers start with UDV. So let's try and change the batch ID here. Don't you have to go to the contract? This is the contract already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, it only stored the first one. You don't have to refresh. Uh, no, no, no. no, no. Three, three. No, no. I, I rerun it. Three, eight, okay. four, one. Three. Sorry. Well, this one. Yeah. Three, eight, four, one. So you can only you can only store one object per uh, per batch at the moment. We'll, we'll see we'll see if we can improve it. Okay. Questions. So the batch idea just to identify that you use uh, it can also be one number because it's very why is it so long then? What, whatever you want. All right. Whatever you like want. Two. We, we can call it. So let's let's uh, let's have some fun and let's uh, fill the blockchain with with crap. We can just call it one 
and this we call it two. Let me save. And do we know here, the? No, sorry. Here we we have to change some name because I'm using the same context that in both. So I will use context ID one, context ID two. Let me run this again. Yeah. So another random array, another uh, timestamp. Let's look at this. Okay, so this it returned me the, the array. LLI entry six. LLI entry six. So this the batch uh, context ID A uh, created this and context ID B created that. So can I ask you one question, one more question? Sure. Because, uh, uh, um... Okay, so the stuff that we saved on the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these data, uh, my guess is that they have like a, a transaction ID, like each of, each of them. But now I, I guess no. we, don't, we do not know them, right? For the because moment, you only know, so this is the blockchain right now. For the moment, okay. you only have the batch ID. If you need more, let me know. Okay. Now I'm just wondering, yeah, because, because I mean, it's great to put uh, to use Sendrom and that you can put stuff on the blockchain. But yeah. if you have, if you have, like for example, another program that does auditing or whatever, then then these transaction IDs mean I think they mean less than uh, the transaction IDs, because the transaction IDs are the actual stuff uh, that that is meaningful. But I'm not I'm not I'm not completely sure because I'm uh, uh, I'm not a sawtooth expert. Yeah. So but, 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 but this, this is what I what yeah. I guess. Yeah, look at look at this. I saved okay, nine nine B three one is this one. Nine B three fifteen. And then there is three C four three seven, which is not this. So um if you wanna know more about how so it works under the hood, that we need Puri or Jarmil, which we can have. But just so that you understand, those of you who have been working with Ethereum are, are probably a bit puzzled now of the way this works. Uh, we put together this, uh, this code for the use case of people who need exclusively to store small amount of data like hashes on, uh, on a ledger. So we're using this not as a blockchain, but as a ledger. Uh, we can also, we also have code that uh, we haven't deployed yet, but it works and we, we tested it. We have code that allows you to send a script or, or a smart contract written in Zenroom with data to the blockchain. The blockchain, the blockchain will execute it twice on each node. And if the output is the same of each of the node, then it's gonna be written on chain. So this way we have a, we have a sort of a, hard-coded uh, uh, consensus uh, mechanism that drives Sorry, the blockchain. Can you repeat what you just said? I didn't get how it works. So. All right, so here, uh, what I've just showed you, it's simply an, an API that sends some data to a node of the blockchain and the blockchain just stores it. On the, the, so the, the server just stores it on, on the blockchain. This is using a blockchain like a ledger, not like a uh, distributed computing uh, platform. We can, nonetheless, also have uh, something similar like the Bitcoin uh, um, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus, in a sense, or the, the Ethereum uh, consensus, in a sense that we have scripts to send to Sorum smart contracts written in Zen code along with data. So you send this smart contract with some data, then the soul room executes it twice on each of its four nodes. And if the output is the same on each of the eight executions, then the output will be stored on blockchain. 
this is the, the proper way to use a blockchain. We didn't publish that yet because all of you guys, well, all the guys in Ledger that want to use uh, this, they basically only need to, uh, to store a hash and retrieve a hash, or at least that, that's what we understand so, so far. Then, uh, sorry, it, it would be good to use that for uh, having some kind of proof of existence mechanism or timestamping, for example, isn't it? Uh, yes. Yeah, for, for storing the hashes on the ledger, yeah. Yeah, okay. but you, this you can do, okay. So here we are storing in two different uh, uh, blocks, we are storing data and a timestamp. But look at what we can do. Look at what we can do. Um, so we have two objects, one called random array, one called timestamp. We can mm -hmm. do given I have a, uh, okay, this we're gonna do a yeah, string dictionary named uh, payload, showroom payload. Okay. All right, I have this, no, sorry. No, I have to create it here. Here I create an object. When I create a string, I have to go and check my own documentation. Hold on a second. This, this is the way I work with, uh, with API room when I don't remember stuff. So in this example, I remember that I'm creating dictionaries. Let, let me see how I do that. When, yes, this one. When I create the number dictionary. Okay. So here I do when I create, not a, but the. That was why I was bitching. When I create the hash, the petition. Okay, I don't have it here, but anyway, it works. A string dictionary. Here we go. Uh, no, this won't work. What the fuck? <laughs> okay, in here I rename it. And I rename the string dictionary to something else. The string dictionary to uh, showroom to my payload, okay? Then inside the screen dictionary, I insert the random array and the timestamp. How do I do this? When I insert this into that, so. When I insert the timestamp into, correct? No, in, not into, even though it should be the same. But anyway, in my payload, yes. And then I do the same thing with my random array. Good. Yes. All right. Then let's also print. No, those two will not work anymore because they don't exist by themselves. So we're going to comment that and we're going to print my payload instead. And here we're going to save my payload into my context ID one. And this we comment. And this we call it JSON payload. 
Okay, now I'm doing some live, live coding that I've never tried before. Let's see if it works. Create API, right. You're very brave, Andrea. <laughs> I know, risk is my second name. Right, payload to showroom. Okay, let's see. It seems to work. Let's look at the batch ID. Let's see what's in the batch ID. Ah, but my payload is empty. JSON payload. Hold on. I, I probably fucked up something with the, the, the object names. Uh -huh. My context ID JSON payload. Then print my payload. Okay, let's see what it saved. Oh, oh yeah, something went wrong. Hold on a second. This should have worked. And when I rename, when I insert, Okay, let me try and run this here. Uh, okay, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this uh, later, and uh, because now there are ten people watching, uh, but uh, this should work because here I am creating a dictionary. I am renaming it and I am inserting something into something else and it runs. Here we go. So the same code, there is no reason why it doesn't work there. When I insert the, when I, ah, yes. Okay, that was the error. I put the, the too much. Here we go. When I insert, yes, save. Let me see. When I insert, all right, let's try again. Right payload to showroom, that's the same thing, right? I refresh, here we go. Yeah, this is, this is fucked up because this was a base 64 and I saved this as a string, but that, that we can fix. And this is the timestamp. So this is the ID. Let's go and see if it's stored here. Well, uh, it didn't, but with this is like, guys, this is the, the beauty of uh, doing live coding. It stored something, but it didn't store the object, but we will, uh, that's, that's a bug that we'll fix. Okay. So for, for now, who of you wants to make experiment just uh, uh, write a, just try, try to save a single hash. And that will make sure that you can uh, write more complex object. I was I was still suspecting this to work. I'm very surprised because we did some tests before by storing a JSON and it did store a JSON. It can store, as you've seen before, it can store um, a, uh, an array. It can store a number, it can store a string. We haven't tried uh, JSON yet, but we'll figure something out. Hey, Andrea? Yes. Uh, is there any way to search in uh, somehow in the stored value in the in the blockchain in the source of blockchain? Yes, we do have an explorer, uh, which is this. 
which is not connected to this blockchain now, uh, we have this like 50 lines of code. Is it, is it working? I don't think it is. Even though this looks, uh, I don't think it's working. Anyway, we have uh, this. Mm, no, we have uh, this explorer. Actually, we have two blockchain explorers. One is the one you've seen, which is super simple. And then we have another one that I can't even, I can't even remember. But uh, the next step is that we deploy this on a, one of our servers. And uh, basically, this needs to be restarted to, to read the blockchain again. So it reads the blockchain, it caches some stuff. And then when you relaunch it, it reads the rest. And uh, yeah, we, we can make this searchable. So this is, this, what, this is what we have from now. So the stuff that we're showing, it, it, it has been running for the first time on Tuesday. Okay, more questions? Oh, thanks for showing it. Cool.